Hi, welcome back to Connected Rheumatology. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Ortiz. I'm so glad you're with us here today. For those of you new, welcome. Connected Rheumatology is a rheumatology practice based out of Dallas, Texas. We are open to new patients both in Texas and in California. And our mission is to provide state-of-the-art and compassionate rheumatology care. And one of the ways we do that is through education. And so that is what this YouTube channel is. Here at the Connected Rheumatology channel, we talk about all things rheumatology, immunology, diet and movement, and mental health and wellness because we believe it is all connected. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, make sure you like this video, subscribe, I think hit the bell so that you get notified so you don't miss out on any of the important rheumatology information. Share this with any and everyone you think might benefit. It helps get us in front of more eyeballs so that we can just spread the information, get conversations started, answer some questions, and just in general, help people understand their health. All right, so we are in June which seems incredible that we could already be in June, but we're in June and June is Scleroderma Awareness Month. Now, scleroderma or systemic sclerosis is a very poorly understood, rare condition within rheumatology. And I feel like I say that about like all of our conditions, oh, it's so poorly understood. But when I'm talking about scleroderma, I, it really is. So we're gonna be going into some facts about scleroderma, things to consider if you've recently received a diagnosis or you know someone who's received a diagnosis, to try to demystify it, make it not as scary, and get you thinking about some questions that you wanna ask your own doctor. So let's get into it. All right, so I like lists, so we're just gonna start. Number one, systemic sclerosis is an autoimmune condition that is characterized by out of control fibrosis. Mm -hmm. Thought I was gonna say inflammation, but fibrosis. So some quick facts, scleroderma um, usually if, is more seen in women. In fact, the ratio of women to men is three to one, and the average age of diagnosis is around 40. Now that does not mean that only 40 year old women can get scleroderma. Just like any of these other conditions, really anyone can get it from older individuals to children. If you have, or you know someone who has an autoimmune condition, you are probably well versed in the idea that autoimmunity is very closely tied with inflammation, right? When we think of someone in a flare, whether it's a flare of lupus or arthritis, we think of their signs and their symptoms as being very closely connected to this out of control inflammation. Now, in scleroderma, there is inflammation, but it is not nearly as prominent or obvious as those other conditions. The bigger problem that we see with scleroderma is actually fibrosis. All right, so what is fibrosis? Well, in a very general sense, it is thickening and scarring of tissues. So if you think about, if you happen to have a scar, that skin is thicker, it's tougher, and it might even be bound down to you a little more compared to the surrounding skin that isn't part of the scar. And that is because that skin has fibrosed. Now, that is a normal response. It is a normal healing response that the body has. When you have scleroderma, however, that response has gotten out of control, and you can have diffuse fibrosis throughout. Number two, Raynaud's phenomenon is usually, or can often be, the first symptom. Now, Raynaud's phenomenon is very common, and what it is, it is an over-exaggerated response to cold or stress. So all of us, when our fingertips, for example, get exposed to cold or stress, the tiny blood vessels will constrict, and that's normal. In Raynaud's, however, that constriction is just a little tighter and lasts a little longer than in other individuals. And it can actually lead to color changes within the fingertips. So first, our blood vessels constrict and our fingertips can turn white. That's as we're starting to see a lack of oxygen. 
that lack of oxygen will continue and the fingertips will then turn blue. Once those blood vessels open up again, we get a rush of blood, our fingertips will then turn red, and that actually can be the more painful part. And it is that entire cycle that we call Raynaud's. Now, before you start freaking out, Raynaud's is actually very common, and just because you have Raynaud's doesn't mean you have scleroderma. But it does probably mean you should go get checked out by a rheumatologist, they know what questions to ask, what to look for to be able to know, do you have just primary Raynaud's or do you have Raynaud's that could possibly be related to something bigger? All right, number three, the most common organ affected in scleroderma is the skin. And just FYI, the term systemic sclerosis is the actual term for the disease. Scleroderma is the word that we use to describe the changes we see in the skin in that disease. Now, in the real world, systemic sclerosis and scleroderma are used interchangeably. So for the sake of this video, I'm just gonna be using the word scleroderma to mean the disease, just because it's easier for me. I mean, you can even see how I'm already starting to trip over my words. So I always just say scleroderma. But we all need to acknowledge that scleroderma, that word really, to be precise, is the word we use to describe what happens to the skin and the actual disease is systemic sclerosis. All right, so getting back to the skin. The skin is the most common organ affected in scleroderma and we've talked about how it can get tough, it can get thicker and it can be bound down. Now, the most common area is going to be the fingertips and the hands. Sometimes, however, the skin involvement can involve the forearm, even the chest, the stomach, the arms, the legs, and sometimes even the face. Other things that can happen to the skin include that the skin can get darker, sometimes the skin can take on a salt and pepper look, and the skin tightening in and of itself can be painful and uncomfortable. All right, number four, there are lots of different types of scleroderma. Now, as I always say, no two patients are the same and that is no less true in scleroderma. And as you know, I am a big fan of educating yourself and researching your condition and the medications and bringing that information and questions that they've popped up in your head from that research to your doctor. However, when I am first diagnosing someone with scleroderma and we're still trying to figure out what type, I will usually advise that my patients to lay off Dr. Google, at least until we know exactly what we're dealing with. And the reason I say that is because there are lots of different types of scleroderma and researching on Google oftentimes gets us to focus on the worst case scenario images that are out there. And all that can do is raise our cortisol from the stress and anxiety. And so before going down that road, I always ask my patients just to trust me, we're going to get an answer, we're gonna figure out what type or what's going on, and then we'll talk about what we're dealing with. And this is the one condition I'll usually say, mm, maybe lay off the internet. And again, the reason I say this is there's lots of different types of scleroderma. Thankfully, the very severe types are rare. Now the two main types are limited, otherwise known as crest syndrome, that's C-R-E-S-T, crest syndrome, or diffuse. And those words limited and diffuse are used based on how much skin is involved. So for those individuals who have skin tightening just really of their fingertips, they might have just limited scleroderma. Diffuse scleroderma indicates that there's most likely more than just the fingertips involved and it might involve the entire arm or maybe the chest and face. And of course, there are nuances and variations within those two broad types of scleroderma, but the key thing I want to point out here is just that no scleroderma patient is the same and that just because you might see a picture on the internet of scleroderma does not mean that that's your type of scleroderma or that you're destined to have that same manifestation. Number five, of course it's more than just skin. As I said before, the actual disease's name is systemic sclerosis. 
So it is systemic. And every person's different. I know I keep saying this, but our different organ systems can be involved. So our gut, anything from our esophagus to our stomach to our intestines, our lungs, our kidneys, our heart, even our joints can be affected by the fibrosis. Sometimes it's very clear in the beginning what a person's dealing with, and sometimes it shows itself later. Everyone is different, and the way we approach these different manifestations is really based on what's going on with that patient at the time. Now, I know that if there are any rheumatologists watching this, they're probably shaking their head being like, oh, I'm completely oversimplifying it, and I understand that. But just for the sake of simplicity, the same fibrosis that we see in the skin can happen in various other organs of the body. And when we get fibrosis in other areas, it interrupts the way those organs work. And that's where we might see a variety of different complications. And again, how we approach that is different for every individual. And then number six, our usual rheumatology medications don't work at least not as well. Now, having scleroderma and treating scleroderma are very challenging. And one of the reasons it can be challenging is because our medications and our strategies that we typically have to fight against lupus and RA just aren't as good in scleroderma. You'll remember that I said earlier that scleroderma didn't necessarily have a lot of inflammation, that it was more about fibrosis. Well, the medications that we use in these other conditions are very focused on inflammation. And the fact that they're not as helpful really is proof that there's just not that much inflammation going on in scleroderma patients. Now, the idea is that inflammation is what kick-started the fibrosis. But that happened months to years before there was enough fibrosis for us to see and make a diagnosis of scleroderma. Once the fibrosis gets going, it's self-perpetuating. And so by the time we make a diagnosis of scleroderma, we have found that the fibrosis, for whatever reason, has largely burned out. And now this fibrosis is just going on its own. We see this also when we do biopsies. When you do a biopsy of the skin, for example, in a lupus patient, you will see within the skin lots of inflammatory cells. You also see that if you biopsy the kidney or you biopsy the lung of a lupus patient. When you biopsy those organs in a scleroderma patient, you might see a couple of inflammatory cells, but what you see mostly is just fibrosis. Now, this is not going to be the case forever. There is a lot of work being done, a lot of studies on antifibrotic medications. Medications that aren't so focused on this inflammatory cascade that we focus on with RA and lupus, but more on the fibrotic cascade that happens in things like scleroderma. And we're seeing some success, especially in those who have very severe lung disease. Now, if you have mild to moderate scleroderma, we still are, figuring things out, trying different medications, but as a whole, we don't have a one-size-fits-all strategy when approaching a scleroderma patient. But stay tuned, it's coming. And number seven, who your doctor is matters. Scleroderma is rare. It is estimated to be in about one in every 6,500 people, and that includes both diffuse and limited scleroderma. As I've said before, treatment options are limited, and as opposed to some of our other conditions, there really isn't some kind of algorithm that you can just go down, that every individual's treatment plan is truly individualized. And it's for this reason that I say experience matters. Now, this is not to say that just because your physician doesn't, hasn't seen a lot of scleroderma is somehow bad and that you should change doctors. And I am well aware that we all can't go to the preeminent scleroderma expert in the country. And let's be honest, the way you become a preeminent expert in anything isn't usually by having the best bedside manner, but by being a very brilliant creative scientist and researcher. But I just want to acknowledge that experience matters, especially whenever you're taking care of something that's rare. And in order to gauge the level of experience and your comfort level with your expert, 
I have a suggestion for a few questions you can ask. One is, how many cases of this have you seen? And the second question is, who do you confer with when you have medical questions or a difficult case? Now, you might think these questions are invasive or none of your business and that you should just trust your doctor. And my answer to that as a doctor is no. You would never take your car to go get fixed by someone who has never fixed a car. And it's no different with your health. I mean, it is different with your health. It's more important. I mean, is it, yes, it's more important. And it's also good to know that your doctor has a network of other doctors that they talk to about difficult cases. Believe me, this comes up all the time, especially in rheumatology, where there's still so much gray area and so many different directions you can go. For better or for worse, I am always honest with my patients when I have reached my limit and I need to go get some help from my colleagues. And I think it's important that my patients know that I'm doing that. And if you're not getting that kind of transparency, then just ask. I would certainly not take offense if someone wants to know if I've seen cases like theirs. And I would certainly not take offense if they choose to go see someone who has more experience in that area than I do. When you're dealing with a rare condition, you deserve to be seen by someone who has seen your condition before. All right. So that's all I've got about scleroderma. Obviously, there's a lot more to be said, but I really just wanted to touch on some of the most basic principles and ideas about scleroderma and systemic sclerosis. Um, it can be a very scary diagnosis to give and definitely a very scary diagnosis to receive, but it doesn't have to be. I have taken care of tons of scleroderma patients, all kinds, both limited diffuse and all in between, and I've certainly witnessed how it is completely possible to continue to thrive even in the face of this diagnosis. I would love to hear any of your questions or comments in the comment section below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and share it with anyone and everyone you think might benefit. Subscribe to the channel if you want to hear more information. I've been collecting requests from some different videos about antibodies to cover and different conditions to cover. So I'm going to be doing all of that. Make sure you hit the bell so you don't miss out on any of those room topics that maybe you were interested in. And yeah, we talk about all things rheumatology, immunology, diet and movement, mental health and wellness because it's all connected. It's all connected. All right. Thanks and have a great day.